All right, in video two, we left off with the life cycle of Abelia, uh, the typical benthic hydrozoan colony, and now we are going to be moving to the true jellyfish, which are in the class Scyphozoa. Remember, hydrozoa, or sorry, um, the Cnidarian has three classes, hydrozoan, anthozoan, and Scyphozoan. These are the pelagic medusoid life forms, which are what we know as your typical jellyfish. Here we go. This is a, quite a large lion's mane jellyfish. Here is something that is newly hatched. It's called an ephyra, and you'll understand what that means uh, very shortly. There's a um, freshwater jellyfish with uh, a big planktivorous one, lots of filtering area. Okay, Obelia, um, somebody making lots of money off of uh, building tanks, specialized tanks for these right now in the UK. Here is a typical, um, well, this is a jellyfish that we get a lot of blooming in uh, the early spring uh, through to early summer, or late spring through to early summer when the water warms up around here. Um, and uh, another quite uh, beautiful uh, black and yellow jellyfish that's more of a fish eater and you can tell that because of the long larger tentacles so less adapted for straining out plankton and more adapted for capturing big prey okay scaphozoans they're slightly more complex than simple hydrozoans um, and we'll have a look at the anatomy to have a look at why they're a little more complex in a in a moment uh, the medusa is more specialized for its midwater life st style and uh, less specialized for whereas the whereas the hydrozoans were specialized for sticking to a benthic um, surface then these ones are specialized for living in the plankton and they have a very thick acellular mesoglia so you remember that mesoglia is that um, proteinaceous gel that is in between the endoderm and the epiderm and if you've ever picked up a jellyfish you'll know that they are actually um, they're quite weighty and thick and um, only slightly deformed and that's because of that thick mesoglia which gives them their their structure okay so here we go let's have a look at the um, a very basic uh, scopozoan a jellyfish okay this one's Aurelia and you don't need to know all of these terms, but it should give you an idea of how much, uh, how there's a little bit more complexity than in the um, uh, than in the hydrozoans. All right, so we have the same body shape, though the same general body plan. We got the oxumbrella side with the epiderm going around on the outside, and then you'll see the gastroderm or endoderm lining the gastric cavity or the stomach or the gut okay the gastroderm and they interestingly enough have a um, their gonads inside the stomach so they don't digest their babies somehow but expel them through their through their mouth or manubrium and um, then you see the tentacles down here for prey for uh, for or for prey capture and for defense. Okay, the sub umbrella side. This whole thing is called the bell or the umbrella. And we see also in these things this interesting little cavity here. Okay. So what is it if you stop and think for a moment about what sort of adaptions an animal needs to live in the water column? Okay, so the water column might be four or five thousand meters deep. Could be even deeper, and depending on where you are in the ocean. And if you are um, a jellyfish, you're probably want to, going to want to stay near your prey. So imagine for a moment that whole depth, four thousand meters of water column. Do you think that your prey is all is going to be scattered evenly throughout that? water column or will it be centered in one depth band or perhaps near the surface or perhaps down deep well obviously it's going to be centered it's going to be uh, patchy and it's going to be centered in one depth band so as a 
an organism that lives in the water column, you're going to need a mechanism to um, be able to stay at a target depth. And so that little um, hole right there is something called a statocyst. All right. So now this is a really interesting um, and uh, sort of early adaption for uh, some of the early adaption, but something that's successful enough to still be around. And what it is, a cyst, as we saw in with nematocysts, is a, an invagination or a fold or a, a little cavity. And you can see that little cavity there. But if you look at what is inside that cavity, there's something called a statolith. Okay, so lith refers to rock, stato referring to maintain, maintaining uh, sameness. So this rock is used, this little bit of rock is used to maintain um, uh, the position in the water column. And uh, it's a, it is a rock. It's a calcium carbonate, like with like a seashell. It's a little round thing that's secreted by the um, by the organism. And then you see all of these little nerve fibers, which are just like the hairs on your arm. So when the wind blows, you can tell which way it's blowing because of the direction that the hair is pulled across your uh, skin. So these things can tell which direction the uh, rock in the middle is sinking and if this is let's say this is vertically up if the rock moves to the side then these ones will be stimulated and it will need it knows that it'll need to turn to go from in this direction up okay so but in this this way these um, jellyfish can swim and hold themselves at a certain level within the water column Okay, Scyphozoa uh, general characteristics, they all have tentacles, they're dioecious, so they have male and female rather than being hermaphrodites, like the, um, uh, like a lot of the hydrozoans were. These are dioecious, so that means they're um, sexually distinct between the males and female. Gonads are gastrodermal, that's right, in their stomach, like we talked about before. And they um, have these statocysts, which we've already covered. Okay, general characteristics again. So now here is uh, what you may find, especially in coastal uh, scyphozoans, at a good portion of the the uh, scyphozoans that live near water, uh, near land masses, will have this exhibit this um, two-stage life life cycle. Okay. Again, we see the fertilized egg in the plania, the ciliated larva that we've seen in um, in peripherans and the hydrozoans. And what happens is that that jellyfish larva well, can actually settle on the bottom, and then it creates these stacks like a pancake of things called uh, well the, these. A phyra, but the the thing the anemone look like organism with all of these little stacks, like pancakes stacked on top of each other, is called a strobilia, and it functions just like an anemone or a hydrozoan. Okay, so we've got this um, this thing growing and it's eating, it's living on the bottom, capturing prey, just like a any hydrozoan would have. But when the conditions are right, then these little plat, this stack of plates, the stack of sort of frisbee-like things, or this stack of, um, of pancakes, breaks off one at a time, and they they beat their way out, turn it into a pelagic swimming little thing called an ephyra, and then that morphs into the adult uh, of the of the adult jellyfish. Okay, so these. Uh, are a two-stage benthic and pelagic um, jellyfish. Now, it is also possible for this planula larva to skip the benthic stage and go straight to the uh, young medusa, and then the ephyra, and then 
uh, morph into the adult. So typically, yeah, here we go. If you're if the picture doesn't set, um, explain it, then we have this these two wordy uh, slides for you. So typically, two alternating stages with two different body forms. The adult Medusa produces an egg, uh, which is fertilized and hatches into a planula larva, and then that attaches to the substrate and forms a polyp, a scaphostoma. And um, if you look on the the uh, Moodle page, you'll see jelly birth, jellyfish birth from a strobilia on YouTube. That is an excellent video of what um, these things look like when they're uh, when they're breaking off the ephyra. Now here's a picture um, from underneath a rock at the Maori Warrior that I was I took a few years ago, and the white polyps are the scaphostoma of jellyfish. And each can produce dozens of small jellyfish, at it. and so sometimes at uh, the beginning of the year, around November, if we get water blooming or the water warming up quite quickly, and early in the season, we'll get huge, huge blooms of jellyfish. And you may have seen these. Okay, they're like a, a whitish jellyfish, very long tentacles, and um, we can get them in. Uh, amount of up to one every couple of cubic meters of water. And so these uh, are what are responsible. So these wait until the conditions are right and then break off thousands and thousands and thousands of of these ephyra. Now here's a strobilia and here's a um, another micrograph uh, or another photograph of uh, lots and lots of them all with their tentacles all hunting away, ready to go. Here's a close-up of what they what they look like, and you can see the little ephyra waiting to go. And these things here are the tentacles of this um, sort of pseudo polyp. And when these things break away, you'll see this is what the ephyra look like, and those will turn into the adult jellyfish. Okay. So that's about all you really need to know about Scyphozoa. So we'll move on to the Anthozoans. Okay, of the remember Cnidarian has three classes: Hydrozoa, Anthozoa, and Scyphozoa. So this is class Anthozoa, and this is the largest of the Cnidarian classes, which is why we left it to last. 6,000 species, and these are what you're going to see the most of uh if you're looking anywhere benthically. You'll see lots of um, corals. Well, not cor well. You see a few soft corals here, not hard corals here. Sea anemones, though, lots and lots of sea anemones. So here we got some yellow zoanthids. We've got uh, more yellow zoanthids and some sponge. Um, and uh, we've seen quite a few others in our uh, other slideshow. So we'll leave that right now. But anthozoans, they could be divided, in, divided into two major subclasses, which you'll need to know. So the octocorallians, which are um, gorgonian fans, all the soft corals, and things like sea pens. And then zoanthera, and then you need to know two orders within the zoanthera, the actinaria, which are anemones, and scleractinaria, which are hard or stony corals. Now, Sclare, right here, this root, whenever you see that, means rocky. So actin area, if you can remember actin area and then put rocky on it, then that's a good way to remember hard, stony corals. Rocky, stony, actin areas. Okay. So they don't have a Medusa stage. They um, never are planktonic. Uh, so whereas in Hydrozoa, and um, Scyphozoa, we saw planktonic stages. They are um, either solitary or colonial. And if you can imagine a solitary, what kind of anthozoan is a solitary one? That's right, a uh, an anemone and a colonial one would be. That's right, a coral. Okay. Sexually reproduced by broadcast spawning, and you may have seen the the videos or. Um, the David Attenboroughs, that type of thing where you see coral reef spawning. That's uh, the typical way of spawning for anthozoans. 
or they may asexually butt off the parent, just like we saw in hydrozones. And if you see a colony, then you know they're all clones of each other, and they all came from a single original polyp that settled. Okay, so octocorallians, sea whips, and soft corals. They're always colonial. Uh, they're characterized by having eight tentacles and rely on water currents to bring food with them. Often found in reef areas with high currents and more open during the day than night, which is different to the hard corals. Okay, the hard corals are generally night hunters. There's a leather coral, sea whip. Okay, there's a sea pen, Gorgonian sea fan. Which, oh, if you're lucky enough to go up to PNG next year, then you'll be able to see lots and lots of these. Okay, and then here are some more sea fans, and here's a gorgonian that we see lots of locally, which is called dead man's fingers. So if you can imagine, like a uh, somebody, um, a body being left on the on the ground, and then all the little fuzz growing on it, this is what this is called a dead man's fingers. But you'll see these diving at um, uh, at Motiti, but you'll definitely see lots of them when you're diving up at Vidyanga. So if you touch these things you'll see all that the uh, all the little polyps withdraw and if you look very closely at them you'll always you'll see that there are always eight tentacles on each of the polyps and each one of those little white fuzzy bits is a polyp okay another gorgonian fan being fed on by a by a nudibranch and here's a big um actinarian the big um mushroom coral okay finger leather coral and then another uh, deep water one Okay, so octocorallians, they're connected via, the polyps are connected, so they communicate with each other through something called senenchyme, which is mesoglia and tubes that go between the different polyps. And um, the senenchyme allows the polyps to share resources and information, so one polyp might be in a good place for feeding and it may share food around throughout the colony. And then they have an internal skeleton composed of spicules or a horny material derived from the mesoglea, which, which provides support. So let's look here at what a typical um, colonial uh, um, anthozoan looks like. So if we look at the, um, you'll see the hydrozoan, or the, um, You'll see something like the dead man's fingers out there, or a whip coral, a soft coral. And you'll notice that they've got this sheath over them, a lot like the colonial hydrozoans that we see, but a little more complex. It's got the tubes, all these little tubes that go from one colony to the next, or one, sorry, one um, polyp to the next. And these things can share food around between them. And they've also got this axial rod, which, um, is where nerve fibers are located so these things can share information between them as well so if one is threatened then you'll notice that the whole colony will withdraw even if you don't touch all uh, all the polyps of the colony they'll all withdraw to pr for protection and you'll also notice that we have what are called the septa which are divisions within the body cavity. This is important for development of complexity, evolutionarily speaking. We'll see that there's much more compartmentalization into different cavities within the body in um, further more complex phyla. And so we need to notice that this, these anthozoans all have these divisions where the hydrozoans don't. They're just one bag within a bag. But these ones are actually loads of little bags uh, because these septa divide these divisions, divide each of these cavities, or divide the, the polyp into, into several cavities, depending on which type of anthozoan you have. Okay, so zoantheria. So we've done that. That's the ant anthera or the oh, sorry that's the general characteristics of actinaria sorry the general characteristics of anthozoa all right were covered here and now we're moving on to 
the two orders okay of anemones and stony corals the actinaria and scleractinaria scleractinaria okay so let's look at actinaria first the sea anemones they don't have a skeleton they attach to the substrate by a petal disc and you'll have seen that in the lab with those big anemones that we have and how they're attached quite hard firmly to the uh, the fish tank and if you go down to Leisure Island you'll see um, that they are and try to remove one of the big ones you you can um, get your fingers underneath it but not easily and that if you can you can work them out uh, away from the rocks but sometimes um, they'll be just attached too hard okay um, and they have again they're radially divided by the filaments called the septa okay so here again we'll send same thing that we've seen before just the septa dividing the um, the the segments within the the body okay so here are some jewel anemones uh, another one of those camouflage anemones camouflage anemone green anemones again from uh, Leisure Island War red warata anemones and this is a uh, an unusual one that I've never seen before, but I would love to get a look at. Um, it's, uh, you can see most of its tentacles are kind of withdrawn, but it's got this bubbly sort of pattern. Okay. Polyp um, and if we look at scleractinaria, which is the rocky ones, the polyp's very similar to the anemones. It's got the septa, um, 12 or more tentacles, and they are stony corals. Large, mostly colonial. We've got a few stony corals that are known as cup corals here, but um, they are in individuals, and so we don't have reef building corals in New Zealand, uh, unless you go to the Kermadex. Um, so these uh, these are the ones that uh, you'll find at places like the Great Barrier Reef. They secrete a cup of hard calcium carbonate. The um, skeleton of the of the um, coral reef is called the theca and they can build huge reefs the largest uh, man-made or sorry biogenic um, organisms on the planet or okay largest biogenic structures all right and you'll see these little cups the theca uh, or that are in the theca and these are what the polyp can withdraw into in order to protect itself largely during the day and mostly at night they come out to feed all right they get grazed on by things like um, parrotfish and so uh, they try to make themselves less visible when the parrotfish sleep at night so here we go here are a few different there's a variety of theca forms from scleractinaria okay so you'll see that these are all different uh, polyps that the corals can withdraw into there's a brain coral uh, this would be um, a, f uh, what do you call a, um, a flat tabletop type coral. All right, these would be structures from a uh, what's called a fire coral or elkhorn coral. Um, here is a an individual solitary cup coral structure, a theca. Here's what they look like at night when they've come out when the polyps come out. So quite different at night, and I highly recommend a night dive on a coral reef if you ever get the chance. There's a nice little staghorn or elkhorn coral, branching coral, staghorn coral. Okay. And a little finger coral. Okay. And so what happens is these um, the individuals just build a new uh, theca on top of the old one, and that's how these things get to be so big. Okay. They just keep growing new colonies on top of the old ones and you can see the branching that allows it's just like tree branching it allows for uh, lots of light exposure and we'll look at why they like light exposure in a moment okay so um, they may be hundreds of years old and we can see uh, how old they are by aging them like trees okay so the dark band formed in winter when there's low growth and light band formed in summer. 
And you say, well, what what do you mean in summer and winter? In tropics, there really is no summer or winter. There will be seasonality, though. There will be really, um, maybe a difference in temperature of a few degrees or a rainy versus um, versus dry season. And so you can count the rings just like the rings of a tree and see how old that, cor that coral colony is. Okay, so here we go. Again, uh, they feed at night for the most part. Okay, and that's because mostly zooplankton move into the surface waters in darkness. Okay, so that's diurnal. That means twice a day they move. They go up at one movement and down during the other uh, during the other movement. So they go down to avoid. Um, a lot of visual predators, but there's lots and lots of plankton. It's really amazing to go to sit in uh, a boat at night with a spotlight out on the water and just see what swims by. There's lots and lots swimming around that will be hidden in the substrate or down at the depths during the day. And we'll talk about more about that as you progress through um, different levels of ecology, ocean, open ocean ecology. Okay, so they also d derive up to 95% of their nutrient from the zooxanthellae that live in their tissue. Okay, so zooxanthellae are, um, uh, they are other individual organisms. They're a little algae, okay, or a um, cyanobacteria, which is a photosynthetic bacteria. And they live within the tissue and the mesoglea of the coral polyp itself. So they have these little things living inside them, which make a lot of food. And the extra food that they uh, they get will, or that they that they can make through photosynthesis, can be used by the coral polyp. And in class, we'll go through exactly how this system works. Just know that they're called zooxanthellae for now, and that they carry on photosynthesis, and the extra food that they make um, is can be utilized by the coral. Okay. Microscopic algae, and that's what also makes the colors of the zooxanthellae, or, or the, the zooxanthellae make the colors of the coral, and that's what makes the uh, bright colors. Okay, and they can be moved away, they can be stressed, and the, the uh, coral can bleach. And that's what we see when all of these little um, color, colorful spots, which are the zooxanthellae, are expelled. Here you see the um, uh, these tips with all the nematocysts lined up in them of these tentacles, and the zooxanthellae, which are um, for which are photosynthesizing and making food. Now, if the coral bleaching happens, which is a big uh, buzzword these days, coral bleaching, then what happens is the coral may expel or actually eat the, um, ingest the zooxanthellae that are living in their tissue because they're stressed, they need the food, and um, you wind up with a living coral that's white. Here you go. It's still as it's bleached here. It's still got a little bit of color here, and um, the tissue is clearly visible and inflated here, but without the pigmentation of the zooxanthellae. Um, the white coloration comes from the skeleton visible underneath the tissue, and so that may or may not survive depending on whether it can um, find it can feed without gaining nutrients from the um, photosynthetic process. Okay, so they either recover by recovering their zooxanthellae or they starve to death. Okay, so reproduction, they both reproduce both sexually and asexually. Okay, then they um, will reproduce sexually in mass spawning events or they can produce free-swimming larvae, or they do produce free-swimming larvae after the um, after the eggs are um, fertilized, which settle and form new colonies, or asexually they could bud new polyps. 
And that is it for Nideria.